Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, and executioner, and our word for today is Fremdschämen. As you can tell by the umlaut, it's from the German, the same language that gave us such beautifully descriptive words as Schadenfreude and Buckpfeifengesicht. Fremdschämen is embarrassment felt on behalf of someone who does not seem to realize they're making a complete fool of themselves. Prior to Sean Spicer's press briefings, the largest recorded instance of Fremdschämen occurred on December 4, 2014, when roughly 9.21 million viewers tuned in to be vicariously mortified by our next offender, Peter Pan Live. NBC has been playing it safe with their selections for live television musicals, and it doesn't get much more safe than Peter Pan, a show that had been staged for television no less than three times prior to this version, not to mention the recording of the 1998 Broadway revival with Kathy Rigby. It's tried and true material, and it featured Christopher Walken, one of those actors with a remarkable tendency to just show up and make any movie he's in better. At least until this one. But we'll come to that. Let's examine the case of Peter Pan live. Our story takes place in the land of make-believe version of Edwardian London, where Wendy, John, and Michael Darling are playing about doing Edwardian children things before bedtime, when their parents will tuck them in before going out to do Edwardian parent things and leave their kids completely unattended except for the family dog. Mr. Darling fulfills his role of Killjoy Patriarch by telling Wendy she's too old to be reading fairy tales and sending the dog Nana out into the yard for the crime of shedding on his suit. I'm the master of this house. I refuse to allow that dog to lord it over me any longer. Nana's place is in the yard. Oh, please, no. Ba, ba, ba. I... Theater aficionados will note that this particular production is breaking with tradition in not double-casting Mr. Darling with Captain Hook. I consider this to be a mistake. Although the convention was almost certainly born out of convenience, it does create an effective symmetry. Both Mr. Darling and Hook represent a cruel, unforgiving form of adulthood that seeks to squash youthful innocence and play. Either Christian Borle should have played Hook, which, let's face it, is already proven to be an awesome idea, or Christopher Walken should have knuckled down and played Mr. Darling too. Although between his age and the evidence to come, that probably wouldn't have worked as well. Mrs. Darling wants Nana to stay with the children because she's concerned about the strange flying boy who's been sneaking around their bedroom and whose shadow she has managed to steal, though she's not so concerned about it that she's willing to do anything herself. So with a lullaby that allows Kelly O'Hara to make the most of her truly thankless role, she tucks the kids into bed, and no sooner does she exit than a CGI effect comes into the room. This is a shot that says, we're spending a lot of money on this effect, and damn it, you're going to watch it. And here comes the world's most famous trouser roll right behind to retrieve his lost shadow and stick it on with soap. There's a life hack you don't hear of too often. Boy, why are you crying? I'm not crying. I'm not even faking it very well. Alison Williams as the title character is our sin number two. Peter Pan is the eternal child with all that implies. He is fearless, joyful, and vibrant, just as he is thoughtless, arrogant, and self-centered. Williams comes off as too sophisticated and introspective for Peter. It's almost as if she's playing more what he believes himself to be rather than what he actually is. In her hands, I Got a Crow, a song that should be filled with adolescent bravado, comes off as mild and sincere as a Disney princess I want song. When I look at myself and I see in myself all the wonderful things that I see, if I'm pleased with myself, I have every good reason to be. Wendy is attracted to Peter in that complicated, I'm old enough to have feelings for you, but not quite old enough to really get them way, and she's dazzled by his tales of Neverland, so she takes him up on his offer to come be a mother for him and the Lost Boys and read them stories and sew pockets into their clothing. Or at least teach them how to make do without functional pockets, which is something women have been managing for decades. Whatever, Wendy gets her brothers to come along, and Peter teaches them how to use the aerial harness. Lovelier thoughts, Michael. Christmas! 
And so we get sin number three, I'm Flying, a sequence that is really more impressive on stage than on television. There's only so much you can do with four semi-trained people, three of them minors as far as aerial acrobatics are concerned, and this production does all of them frequently until you're bored with it. Yes, yes, you're swinging on a wire, it's enchanting. Now move on to Neverland before I get motion sickness watching you. We cut to Neverland and the Jolly Roger, where Captain Hook's crew of rejected costume tests for Jack Sparrow are doing what pirates do best, singing shanties about how nasty they are. And here he comes, the fiend of a thousand children's nightmares, the most scurrilous dog to ever sail the seven seas, that most notorious of villains, Captain James Hook. Uh, yeah, this... Behold the field in which Christopher Walken grows his fucks for this role and see that it is barren. Saying he's phoning it in is an insult to phones. It's more like he's texting it in or Facebook liking it in. I swear to Lucifer, you can almost tell where the cue card guy is standing off screen. Mr. Schmee here thinks that I should pack up ship, sail away, and abandon my dear friend Pete Tuppan. He barely manages to talk sing his songs, he sleepwalks through most of the dancing, and he seems more miffed about the whole getting his hand chopped off and fed to a crocodile thing than here bent on revenge for it. Poor Christian Borel, who is double cast as Smee, tries to make up for his lack of energy, but there's only so much he can do. The entire thing is just embarrassing to watch. The pirates who don't care about anything go ashore to hunt down the Lost Boys, who from the looks of things, are all fresh from Neverland's Performing Arts College, and Hook manages to find their hideaway by sitting down, which is about all he has the energy for. Needing to come up with a devious plan, he calls upon his crew to provide musical inspiration. Cook a cake quite large and fill each layer in between, with icing mixed with poison. Till it turns a tempting green. I gotta have more cowbell. Ah! One to show them their mistake. Ah! Let's move on, shall we? The lost cast of Newsies is thrilled to have a girl come and be their mother, and Wendy is pleased to have a bunch of rowdy man children to wait on, which just goes to show that she never saw Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Wendy also ropes Peter into the role of surrogate father, and an extended sequence of playing house commences. And they all lived happily ever after. (laughs) And the end of Hamlet! Hamlet. Wendy also prevents her foster brood from eating Hook's poisoned cake, and when Hook finds out the lost male chorus of Spring Awakening has found a mother, he's so shocked that he can't remember his next line. It's nice to have a mother. Mm. Awkward. So, new plan. Blow up Neverland, kill off everyone on it, and force Wendy to be the pirate's mother. The Lost Jets are oblivious to all this, what with being engaged in perpetual warfare with Tiger Lily and her tribe of multi-ethnic, generically exotic dancers, and having a new mom and all, which they discover is great for the whole stories and pockets aspect, but not so much for the homeschooling part. I won't grow up. I won't grow up. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. Just to learn to be a parrot. Just to learn to be a parrot. And recite a silly rule. And recite a silly rule. I'm starting to realize why I've always had a hard time sitting through this musical. There's not a whole lot in the way of story. While this particular adaptation trims some fat, mainly the weird subplot where the darling's maid Liza follows the kids to Neverland and just kinda hangs around for the rest of the show, not a whole lot actually happens. There's tangles with the pirates and with Tiger Lily and company and singing and dancing, but none of it seems to go anywhere. 
Certainly not when we're on what feels like the 11 billionth reprise of I Won't Grow Up. I know Neverland has a timeless quality, but it shouldn't feel like that when we're watching it. And another thing, if these are all boys that fell out of their carriages as babies, why are they dressed like a cross between the casts of Harry Potter and Lord of the Flies? Tiger Lily finds out about Hook's latest plan, but gets captured by him when she fails a spot check. Meanwhile, Peter has decided Wendy isn't taking the risks of living among pirates and vaguely defined natives seriously enough, so he takes her on a little boat ride for an awkward adolescent interlude. Ah, oh, these feelings, I'm feeling my feelings alone. Do you have them too? Look, the last thing this show needs right now is a love ballad. Even Peter looks like he's thinking, oh, when's she going to be done already? Peter and Wendy come upon the pirates chaining Tiger Lily to a rock, where she will be drowned either by the rising tide or the rising overacting. Peter mimics Hook to convince the pirates to set her free, then engages in a battle with the man himself, who is sounding more and more like a mob enforcer as the show progresses. I'll cut off your hide, which I'll wear as a pelt, and your tongue is my special reward. Hook deals a wicked blow, but is scared off by the deus ex crocodile. Unfortunately, the other pirates have absconded with Peter's boat. Dinghy! That is way too enthusiastic a reaction for an underage boy's dinghy. For a brief moment, Peter and Wendy appear to be in a desperate situation, but Wendy is saved by a passing kite? No, really? And Peter is rescued by Tiger Lily during the commercial break, forging a peace between the two factions. Yes, yes, I'm getting to it. Just go back to your side of the room. So, one of the things more recent adaptations of Peter Pan have struggled with is how to present Tiger Lily and her people, who on one claw are an expected part of the story, but on the other are relics from a time when depictions of indigenous cultures were not entirely accurate or sensitive. Ouch. There have been several ways of dealing with this. Hook ignored the characters entirely, the Peter and the Starcatchers series reimagined them as a completely fictional island culture, and Pan just went and whitewashed them, which created a whole different set of problems right there. This production did have a consultant from the Chickasaw Nation on board, and the result is a significantly less racist reworking of the friendship celebration with a tribe that's... kind of this odd, multiracial group dressed as a cross between Great Plains and Polynesian, I guess? I don't know, it's not entirely perfect, and yet at the same time, I'm not sure how they could have handled it any better. It's hardly the most cringeworthy element in this whole mess by a long shot. You're not fooling anyone, Christopher. We know the taps are dubbed. Wendy puts her surrogate family to bed with a sentimental lullaby, with an assist from her mother because we've got Kelly O'Hara and damn it, we're going to use her, at which point the darling kids start to get a bit homesick. The Lost Barricade boys, having gotten used to having a woman attending to their every need, decide they want to come with. Well, you should all come. Uh, mother and father would adopt you. Can I just say how much this particular plot point has always bugged me? Hi, Mom and Dad, we're back, and by the way, we've brought along an entire male chorus for you to take care of. I don't know how you're going to feed and clothe them all or where they'll sleep or anything, and you're probably at an age where having an extra dozen kids around the house is a terrifying prospect, but I guess that's your problem now. I mean, I know Wendy's only a child and this is a fantasy and all that, but sweet Lucifer... Peter wants to stay in Neverland, however, and has this big dramatic song about how he went back to check on his mom and found out that she'd moved on with his little brother. I suppose the sibling rivalry is appropriate, but it's still way too maudlin for this character. When I went home, I counted so upon somebody waiting up to ask me questions on and on. A 
Alas, unbeknownst to our heroes, Hook and the pirates have kidnapped the vaguely defined natives, and once the kids start to head out on their return journey, they pick them off as well. Hook stays behind to poison Peter's medicine with the most obvious toxin known to man. Seriously, that stuff is like the anti-iocane powder. But Peter is still oblivious, requiring Tinkerbell to take the bullet for him and inspire everyone's favorite audience participation routine. Children. Children all over the world. I need your help. Please say you believe. Oh, oh, I believe Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is a better musical than the producers. I believe, I believe, I believe, oh, I believe, there is love in heaven. I believe in sleep. I do believe in spooks. I do believe in spooks. I am a man who believes in a lot of things. I'm a man who believes in a lot of specific things. I mean, I haven't had any in a while, but... I still believe. Yes, yes, I do believe in magic in a young girl's heart, or the musical Freer and whatever the rest of the lyrics are. I do believe in it. I believe that there is still good in humanity, despite what today's news and even some other people might have to say. I believed in unicorns until one killed one of my family members. Wait, berries? I'm gonna get back to you on that. I believe that the Montreal Screwjob was a work. And on top of that, it's very easy to get downtrodden. Just keep looking up. Poor Uncle Frank. I do believe Shark the Musical doesn't exist. Mia. Things will eventually get better. What do you believe in? What do you believe in? What do you believe in? You believe in kitties? Okay. And you can't tell on the recording, but I watched the broadcast and I can promise you this happened. NBC actually tried to get a Save Tinkerbell hashtag going. Sin number seven for an extremely dopey use of social media. So hooray, Tinkerbell saved, and Peter flies off to free his friends from the notoriously apathetic Captain Hook. <laughs> I didn't think it was possible, but I think Walken's giving even fewer shits as this performance progresses. Peter and Tiger Lily sneak on board, so I guess she wasn't captured because, eh? Where they proceed to slaughter every pirate who goes below decks. I tell ya, they don't make children's entertainment the way they used to. The pirates are slightly more savvy than your average horror movie cast in that it only takes them a couple of deaths to wise up to the situation, so they send the lost graduate students to their apparent doom, enabling our heroes to arm themselves and face the pirates in battle. Really, is that the best you could have Windy do, just standing there flailing at the bad guys? You and your kind frightened the boys, kidnapped us all, delayed our return to London, put us in mortal danger, surrounded us with your slovenly dress, putrid odors and unappealing shouting, which only exposed us to your foul breath. Not to mention, you kidnapped Michael's beloved teddy bear! I take your point. Oh, that's much better. Well played. With the pirates captured, it's up to Hook and Peter to engage in sin number eight, the most boring sword fight ever filmed. This is what would happen if the Princess Bride chugged an entire case of NyQuil. It isn't choreographed so much as sleepwalked. It's not a climax, it's more of a, don't worry, it happens to every musical, maybe we should try again when you're more relaxed? It's almost a relief when Hook marches down the plank and Walken exits the movie the way he entered it, lethargic and barely able to summon up interest in anything. Don't rush me. So the darling children are reunited with their parents, who are somehow okay with taking on an entire football team. Wendy grows up to become Minnie Driver, but that's okay because now she has a daughter who Peter can induct into the world of awkward adolescent rite of passages. Forever, never, never Peter 
Pan is a really depressing story once you think about it. It's about how children are eventually doomed to lose their innocence, and how Peter will always be a little lonely because he's incapable of forging a mature, lasting relationship. One of the main problems with the musical version is it never really captures that sense of underlying melancholy, and Peter Pan Live emphasizes that flaw and adds a few of its own. Miscast leads, a lack of energy, and an inability to do anything with the material that hasn't been done already. It's just embarrassing to watch, and the Court of Musical Hell thinks it's only appropriate that those involved are punished by experiencing the chagrin of every single person who watches the fruits of their labors. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned, and after five years of this crap, I need a drink. (laughs) 